Hello, and welcome to Piano Tech Radio Hour, the weekly bridge to the future of the Piano Tech community. I'm David Anderson. And I'm Ethan Janney. And we're here to ask great questions, and then we'll shut up and listen to some of the authorities, experts, and most outstanding personalities in our little world of pianos. So, put on your best set of headphones, and let's get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Piano Tech Radio Hour. Welcome to, to see a you here. beautiful Saturday morning in Southern California. Welcome to a, a cold, degrees. brisk morning in Chicagoland. Wow. <laughs> so today it's uh, it's Tech Talk. It's Piano Nerdville Deluxe. It's me and Ethan talking about anything you want to. I've got a kind of a bug in me this morning about voicing. I want to make my two upper shoulder high near the strike point voicing protocols really clear uh, at one point this morning. Got a little uh, diagram to show you some couple of things. And, uh, other than that, man, we can talk about anything you want to. Um, and why don't you uh, introduce our an intro? And, uh, and, uh, Sounds good. Our patrons. Sounds good. Before I say that, uh, David, careful with where your I don't know where your mic is on your computer, but I think you're kind of massaging it or something. I always do that. I, I do, yeah, <laughs> I just have to keep my hand. And my left all right cool also your internet cut out slightly it 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 did that maybe like 10 minutes ago before we started let me um, see let me see if i'm on the right the right on the right network yeah cool sounds good uh, in the meantime while you're working on that i'll give an intro here so right. um i'm here just uh okay good welcoming welcoming everyone to piano tech radio hour which just to remind you is being brought to you by Piano Technicians Masterclasses, an online educational resource that offers you cutting edge instruction from piano industry masters without leaving your home. You can find out more at www.pianotechniciansmasterclass.com. And we are doing the world's first online piano technicians convention coming up here in December. So make sure you don't miss out on that. We're very excited. We have already um, at least six out of the nine instructors announced that are gonna be part of that convention. David is one of them. We had an early bird special that lasted until December 10th, which unfortunately ended. We're actually doing a second wave early bird special Prices are not as inexpensive as they were before, but you will still save something. So if you missed the first early bird special, hop on over there and don't forget to sign up. We've got a lot of options, um, no matter your budget, so that you can be involved and have a great time and learn a lot with us in December. So I just put the link in the chat if, if anybody like to sign up for that. And next Saturday, two things uh, to remember. For Radio Hour, we will have Isaac Sadigursky, uh, a yeah. great veteran of the piano tech industry with a lot of great information and a wonderful sense of humor. And he'll be hanging out with us next week. And uh, Jude Revely will be presenting his course on turbocharging the grand action at 4 p.m. Eastern time next Saturday. So make sure... You don't miss out on that. That's going to be really exciting. A lot of great stuff coming up. So having said all that, David, did you want to jump in to, to the voicing topic right away and then just see where it takes yeah. us? I was okay. talking to my friend Carl Lieberman uh, in another piano domain and another piano topic, and we started talking about voicing. And he described voicing in a way that I had described it before, but that I, it just like popped it back into my head so beautifully. 
So what you're doing when you voice a set of hammers is you're emphasizing low partials, the tonic, the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth partials. And you're de-emphasizing higher partials, the upper partials, you know? That's what you're, that's what you're in essence doing when you voice a hammer. You're making the hammer sound deeper, fatter, clearer. And that's all a product of hearing lower partials, clearer in the mix of partials in the tone, in that note. And that's exactly what we're doing. And I wanted to, again, discuss and show you to us whatever extent I can, these two strike point voicing protocols that I've used for the last, I don't know, 15 or so years to just uh, highly success, high success with putting a piano in that range that I call the golden tone. Tone that is sweet and amber and warm and liquid at low volume. And that gets not cold, not, not uh, 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 buzzy, but brilliant at high volume. So it really starts to pop at high volume. And that's what we want. That's what basically all pianists in all disciplines want with a few glaring exceptions like rock and roll players that want it all glassy. But the vast majority of pianists want that expression, right? From Joni Mitchell's soft voice to, you know, <laughs> to, uh, uh, you know, Edith Piaf's loud voice, you know? There's a, there's a huge tonal color ambience palette that pianos can get, and you can only get it from, from real attention-based, feel-based voicing. So I'm just going to go through what I do. And uh, Ethan, can you put the picture of that hammer up? I can't hear you. You're. I sure you're... can. Here it comes. Oh, there you go. There it is. All right. So the sacred area of the hammer. That's where needles don't go. However, the most effect you can have is along the sides of that steeple with a single needle. In other words, if you take a, an 11 millimeter single needle and slide it down alongside of that, the outside of that steeple on both sides. Yes, exactly right. So you start out right at the end of the little string cut and get about a, what is that? A 15 degree uh, angle and just let that single needle, 11, 12 millimeters, just drop down into the felt. Just the, the barest guiding hand on the, on the needle. If it doesn't just kind of drop into the felt with the weight of your hand, the felt's too hard. So you wanna 
go out a little bit. What Ethan just did, go down the shoulder of the hammer about a millimeter, angle, and stick the needle in again. If it goes straight in, great. Go out, go up, um, back up to where you began and put the needle back in and it will probably just slide right in. You're basically doing acupuncture on the high strike point of the hammer. You're opening up hard knots in the felt up near the strike point. And that will make the fundamental sound deeper. It will add to the sustain. It will add to the fatness and the clarity of the notes on the piano. So that's where the active area is, right along the outside edge of that steeple, both front and back. And so you're sticking a single needle into the end of the string cuts to see if the, the felt resists. If it does, then work down the shoulder, do it again, stick it in again at, at the same angle. And if it's not, if it doesn't fall in, pull it out again, bring it down another millimeter, stick it in and it will fall in. Then work your way back up toward the strike point and the, the, the felt should be just receiving the needle. Then you're done. Go to the next string cut, do the same thing. Go to the next string cut, do the same thing. Put the action in the piano and see if doing the front of the hammer has, you know, uh, notably changed uh, the tone of the of the of the hammer, and you want it to sound deeper, clearer, maybe more sustaining, a little louder. You want it to be more present, more in your face. So that's and that's good for the whole piano both front and back of the hammers. Any questions before I move on to the next protocol? Any questions at all from anybody? Do not be shy. If you don't David, what is the depth of the needle that you're using um, in, in my toolkit? 11, I yeah, 11 millimeters. 11 so millimeters. good long needle. OK. Goes, goes down probably to the colored part of the felt. It goes in, when it goes in, it goes in all the way. Okay. If it doesn't go in all the way, don't force it. Take it out of that spot, move it down the shoulder a, a bit, a millimeter, and do it at the same angle with the same force. If it just slips in the felt, beautiful. Go back up to the first spot, Try to slip the, 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 the needle in and it will eight times, nine times out of 10, just go in because you've, you've, you've let that, you've, you've softened up that hard spot. It's, it really is like acupuncture. And it's you are like right on the string groove when you do this? At the end. Of the at string the end cut. of the string groove, right? At the end of string, string cut at that fifteen degree angle, right? right? And 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 as close to the as close to the side of the groove, uh, the side of the steeple, as possible without without ad actually entering that sacred area. That's you can do five sticks in the front of the hammer there, and do more work. Then if you do 25 sticks, just kind of randomly, you know, it's, 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 it's giving the hammers acupuncture. It's loosening these little, the little hard spots right up close to the strike point, right up close to the sacred area that allow the hammer to speak in lower partials 
on a regular basis. So David? Yes. I, I do very similar, except I, I found that on the speaking side of the hammer, you have more effect. So I usually do this on first on the speaking side and then Me on too. The, and 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 I do it a slightly the angle is a little wider. It, it's a little closer to parallel to the side of the hammer than to that steep line that you've drawn. I kind of angle it a little bit more kind of parallel to the side of the hammer. OK, yeah, I always do the front first and see what that does and then stick the action back in the in the piano and and see if it's enough or not too much or, or, or not enough. If it's not enough, I do the back too because but first I feel it with the needle. It's a feel thing. If the needle feels smooth, then the felt is soft. If the needle does not go in to your hand, just kind of almost like, you know, like easing it in, it's not, it's hard up there and you have to put in, you have to work up to it. You have to, you have to, you have to work that knot out. And, and to clarify, the front, of, the front of the hammer is the side that sits towards the keyboards, towards the player. That's right. That's right. The proximal side, the kind okay. side towards the keyboard, sides toward the player. No, that's it's funny. Where... I, I think that the side that has the most effect is the side away from the key, towards the, the strings, towards the speaking length, I and think has more where... impact. Fanta fascinating because that's not my experience at all. My experience is that 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 the front has more more effect. But you know, hey, the the thing about these things, and I came to find out after I just stumbled on this that this is what Rick Balderson uses. This the Ch the Japanese masters in the in the Japanese factory he said use something like this it's it really is like acupuncture at uh, on the high shoulders and whatever protocol you devise to do it that's really what gives you the most bang for the buck so this second protocol i use is for in the in the action voicing um put that put that uh picture up again ethan so i can sure one second let's see here i'm also working on another illustration that i can put up in a minute let's see here okay so there you go all right so just let's imagine the string cuts on the top of the hammer. Uh, let's say two, three, maximum four millimeter cuts in the felt, string cuts. We all know what they look like. We know if they get too, too deep and too, you know, like Grand Canyon-y, we have to file them out. They get too long, you have to shorten them. They shouldn't be any longer than three or four millimeters. There you go. Yeah. Wow. Ethan, I'm in awe. So, so you were saying, by the way, you do this protocol that you just talked about. You do yep. that um, at all each of the string cuts, right? You don't just do I it. I do. You would do each it of like the string here, cuts. Here, yes. Here. And each of the okay. string cuts may have a different hardness. You may do the first one and get it soft, and the second and third one are already soft. You may do the first one and it's, you know, you got to move around a little bit and work up to it up the side. And you may have to do that on the second and third one too. It just, it depends on the hammer. It's felt, it's organic material. So you got to feel it with a single needle. That's why I only use a single needle because it's so much more precise. And you can really feel where the hammer, where the felt is hard. 
in the hammer. So the string cuts, and they're two, three millimeters, and they're little cuts in the top of the hammer. If you're voicing the piano through the string cuts, I mean through the through the with a chopstick voicing tool. And it's, you know, right before performance. And there's notes that stick out. There's notes that that are louder on forte on a piano or piano forte than other notes. You wanna you wanna dial those back. The way that Udo Steingraber taught me to do it is to go under the string cut with your needle, with the length of your needle and create a tube of air under the string cut, about a millimeter below the string cut, very close. But so that literally there's air that's under the string cut instead of packed felt. And what the and you you what I do is go halfway in under the string cut, then back out, and halfway into the second one, back out, halfway into the third one, back out under the string cut, creating a tube of air under half the cut. Then I, you know, bring the needle out and try the note. And I always do this soft. I don't voice loud because every note can sound good loud. It's how it sounds soft that really matters. So if you get a real soft, warm strike on piano or softer than that, and it's as you hit it harder, it gets clearer and more solid and more brilliant, that's exactly what you want. It's what everybody wants, basically. And so, again, any questions on the through the strings chopstick voicing uh, protocol, what you're doing is, I use a 15 millimeter needle on my chopstick voicing tool, and I've bent it up at somewhere between 10 and 15 degrees. So I can go in through the front under the string cut and can go straight across. The, beetle, the needle is bent so it can go straight in and straight under the string cut. And that's a tremendously effective and relatively long lasting voicing protocol. It will, you can always reverse it. Uh, most of the high string voicing, uh, especially in this protocol, by just putting your thumb on the string and smacking it real hard about 10 times. Um, it will, that will, you know, translate into hours and hours of playing and will take away your little you're unpacking a uh, tube of air. Um, so it's very workable. There you go. Awesome. And you just make a tube of air under those string cuts. Now, questions. I haven't checked the chat in a while. Let me see what we got here. Um, we have... What thickness is the needle? What thickness of needle? It's got to be pretty thick to avoid breaking at 11 millimeters long. It's a six or, a, you know, a, like, a, like a regular stout voicing uh, needle. It's a, you know, they have different numbers for German and English. It's a five or a six. And then there was a question, how many insertions across the width of the hammer? And that was, I think, when you were talking a little bit more about the steeple technique. Yes. You start at the end of each string cut with 
the single needle at a 15 degree angle and just let it fall into the hammer. Let that needle, don't push it in with your hand, let it kind of fall in, just the slightest pressure with your hand. If it doesn't fall in, take the needle out of the end of the string cut, bring it down another millimeter down the side of the hammer, same angle, 15 degrees, same pressure, let it fall in. It may fall in. If it does, great. Take it out, bring it back up to the original spot and let the needle fall in. It will probably fall right in then. Then you're done with that string cut. Go to the next one. Let it fall right in. Um, uh, if it doesn't, walk down a millimeter down the edge of the, of the, of the shoulder. Put it in again. If it just like melts into the felt, you're good. If it doesn't, walk it down one more time. Let it melt in. Walk, walk it up. Do it again. Walk it up. Do it again. You're done. And you'd be amazed at how long softening up those acupunctural spots last as a, as a base voicing act. Of course, your lower shoulders are, are, are opened up and needles go into the lower shoulders. No question. The lower shoulders have to be open for this, for these techniques to work. All right, so that's my, that's the little bug I had uh, this morning. So I got, got a few more questions if you want me to throw okay. them out here. Sure, sure. And again, be careful about uh, scratching your microphone surface. Ah, sure um, Sorry. Let's see. Does this apply across the entire range one through 88 keys? Yes. 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 Now you make in the in the treble, you make the needles a little shorter. You know, you may. I use a, an adjustable needle, a, a tool from uh, Pianoforte Supply that you can adjust the length of the single needle, or of three if you want to use three. But I only use a single needle. Um, so I. I, I put the length down to nine millimeters up in the very top of the piano. But other than that, yeah, you can use this technique along all hammers. Absolutely. Now, I wouldn't, I, I don't think, I've only used it on really, really bound up tight hammers in the last Two octaves. I, I usually use. Uh, I usually don't go all the way down into the hammers for the last two octaves, or I'm. I'm really. It 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 depends on the the character of the hammer set, but I I'm usually trying to add a little pop to those last. Uh, octaves. So I'm trying to maybe shoe shine the hammers to a, a little bit, you know, polish them with fine sandpaper or something. I'm trying to go the other way, I'm trying to bring the, the pop and the sustain up. But yes, absolutely. All 88. No, no question about it. Okay, what else do I got here? I, I, I'm just, let me see if I can bring this other little illustration I put up here. Okay, so I'm assuming that once you get into the high treble, does the angle still stay around 15 or does it actually get a little bit broader because you know, because you need to it, avoid? It, well, yeah, you, you, you don't wanna avoid, you don't wanna put a needle in the sacred area, especially not in the treble where you can ruin a hammer quickly. You wanna, be conservative 
in the treble. As it be- as it shows in the picture. See? Right. Would you be safe to say that the angle changes so slightly as you move into the larger hammer? So you give a little bit of a steeper angle as you move into the larger hammers? Or you do. Or does it like okay. like yes. That 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 yeah. steepest angle that you drew on the hammer is what's right indicated for most of the hammers on the piano except for the last okay. octave got it octave and a half. you can go you 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 have to go a little wider because it's closer to the molding right okay yeah that sounds fair yeah it can get a little bit steeper as the hammer gets bigger it looks like okay um let me see about other questions what thickness of needle we covered that do you ever voice from the side of the hammer? You know, I don't. I know there's a lot of piano technicians that do and have developed it as a legitimate voicing technique. I can't tell you about it because I've never done it. Okay, great. And then uh, just a quick word. I'll have Pooja make sure and put it in the Facebook, YouTube chat, uh, a link so people could join us on the Zoom, but we'll probably cut off the Zoom here in a few minutes. Um, so just make sure if you wanted to jump on the call that you can, uh, or sorry, we won't cut off the Zoom. We'll cut off the live stream on Facebook, YouTube in a few minutes. Okay. All right, next question. Let's see here. Really can any you... question about piano tone or how to make piano tone better? How long is, how long does the air cushion stay from the great question about that great question um it can stay through hours of playing um and you can also reverse it if you feel like you've gone too far and taken too much edge off the tone at low volume you can just put your thumb, if it doesn't irritate the strings with your hand oil, or if it does, put a piece of tape on the string and put your thumb and just damp the string with your thumb and smack it about 15 times. Smack it in a you know, multi, multi way, 10 or 15 times. And that will repack the string cut pretty much. That's why it's, you know, it's reversible to a certain extent if you go too far or uh, customizable if you go too far. Sounds good. Let's see here. Um, it's a question. I'm not sure what it is on the playing side question mark. I think that was just uh, maybe yes. addressing something on earlier. the playing side on the, on the player side. Mm-hmm. That's right. On the proximal side, that's where we're talking about working first. If it doesn't create enough difference working on the, player side, the proximal side, then do the same protocols on the back. Perfect. And then Ken Kopp says, can you talk about the effect on hammer shape and fit? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, different piano technicians have their different idea of what an ideal hammer shape is. Some people will tell you it's an oval. Some people will tell you it's a diamond. Um, Many manufacturers are opting for kind of a diamond shape at this point. I think that's, that's the conventional like inner hip wisdom. So the hammer it needs to be aerodynamic. The hammers all need to basically be in the same general shape. So, and they need to be 
flat on the strike point. They need to be flat so that every all three strings on each note are struck at basically the same time. That's why fitting the hammers to the strings is so important and why it's such a delicate task, pulling the hammer up to the strings and then plucking the, plucking the strings to see it and to not, to really getting that feel. I'm telling you again, working on pianos, especially at the highest level is a subtle, subtle, subtle feel thing. And if your attention isn't there with that subtlety, with that feel, you're not going to be able to do this work at the highest level. Right? When you mate a hammer to a string, and perhaps carve up a little bit the top of a hammer to fit the three strings, you've seated the strings and leveled the strings to your be the best of your ability. And now you're actually bringing the hammers up to the strings with some kind of a hook or some kind of a push. And gently pushing them against the strings and see if they all three are damping when you do that. If they're not, you have some work to do to mate the strings. All three strings must hit the hammer at the same time, flat. So I don't know, Ken, it's super important to final tone to that final, I don't know what to call it, singing of the tone. All of these things together accumulate into more sustain for some reason. You know, matching the hammers to the strings, getting everything flat, getting all the parts flat and straight up and down from the hammer, making sure that the hammer is soft in the right places and hard in the right places, making sure it's voiced properly, making sure just it's little, tuned properly. So just all little. these things make a piano sing, bring out the maximum sustain, maximum low power, partial volume, maximum pleasure really from listening to it. Uh, just a modification here from Ken. He said he was referring to the effect of needling on the shape and fit. Um, I think maybe the question, uh, I'm not sure if you addressed it or not, was as you do this needling, does that mess with how? Oh, yeah. no. Creating the tube of air does not create, that does not mess with uh, the string mating the way I do it, the way the, the uh, I can do the chopstick voicing technique and then check the string mating and it'll be right there. Very rarely does it change the string rating, uh, mating. Um, mostly it does not. Uh, and the first technique uh, 11 needle needles along the edge of the uh, sacred area. That doesn't change the string cuts at all. It may poof out the very end of the string cut, but that's really not. Yeah, it's not a. It's 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 not an important thing. It doesn't change the tone that I've experienced. Thank what changes that. the tone is the fact that the that the there's little spots of hard felt right by the strike point that are becoming softer and more low partials and less high partials. And that's making the tone more pleasant at low volume and stronger, more, more, more fundamental. 
That's what we want. Mark Steiger Fact. asks. Yes. Uh, you want the next question? Mark Steiger asked, uh, steeple technique versus tube of air. When do you use one versus the other? Well, the steeple technique is really for the first voicing of the high shoulders. You've made sure that a needle sticks in, you know, in the little Renner book where they show sticking, sticking the needles, a single needle into or three needles into in the low shoulders into toward that dot in the middle of the shoulder. Well, you got to do that, that you got to make sure that the low shoulders are open. Now on a lot of hammers that are made today, the low shoulders are pretty, pretty open. You don't have to really, you know, smack them 70 times to get them to be soft. They're pretty soft. They just need a few needles. The low shoulders have to be soft in order for the for this work on the upper shoulders to work. What was his question again? I'm sorry. Saying if you're going to choose to do the tube of air versus the other technique, the steeple technique, is there a yeah. specific situation for each to address? Well, uh, there's there's a couple of different factors. One is time. If I have plenty of time, I and the hammers are hard up by the string cuts, I do the steeple uh, protocol because it's more permanent and more permanently giving the piano a lower, deeper, more sustained voice. Um, if it's quick, if I got 15 minutes or 20 minutes, I make tubes of air under the string cuts and it it softens the tone at lower volume, but it doesn't last. It's, it's not as permanent as the steeple effect. Um, so in, in pianos that I maintain, in pianos that I'm preparing for performance or you know just a really good player to play at an hour a day, I, 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 do, this, I do the steeple protocol. I just make sure that the upper parts of the hammer, the, the parts of the hammer that are really close to the string cut and close to the sacred area are soft around, you know, that, that, it's, that it's a soft cushion for that, for that essential hardness inside the middle of the hammer. Perfect, okay, so next we have from Johan Krebs, would you go through the same procedure for the shift left pedal position? I just end up doing the chopstick voicing tool for between, for between, uh, for, for the shift pedal. And what I find is when you get everything lined up with voicing and hammer mating and stuff, then when you, then creating a different tone for all the way over shift is relatively easy because you can make a tube of air in between the string cuts. Use the same exact protocol without destroying the string cuts, which a lot of voicing techniques, especially in the in the unicorda, you know, protocols, lot a lot of those techniques kind of tear up the top of the of the of the hammer a little bit. Um, so yeah. Next question. Next question. Okay. Bruce says, um, it, regarding this idea of putting your thumb, I think to get rid of the tubes yep. of air or to yep. ameliorate that, he yep. says, yep. is that on the strike point on the string? Yes. And make sure your finger doesn't 
for you know follow the string if you put a piece of cloth on there or something don't don't put your oils on the string got it uh nancy says define or describe a hammer ruined by over or poor needling over needling or poor needling okay if you've stuck needles in the sacred area there's a real good chance you've destroyed the integrity of the hammer because there's a place in the felt right above the molding that has to be hard as hard can be hard it has to be it has it's i call it the pearl of doom it has to it's just a little contained knot of energy that powers the hammer and if you mess with that at all you've destroyed the integrity of the hammer the hammer will not sustain in my opinion in my experience so keep your needles out of the sacred area now there's old Steinway hands who've worked on thousands of Steinway concert grands and hammers from the 70s and 80s and 90s and 2000s that say in desperate situations where you have to get the tone down at piano that they could that they stick a needle straight down into the strike point to soften that piano blow um please do that at your own risk i've never done that before but i've heard eric shandall talk about it i've heard i've heard other you know i've heard arlen harris talk about it as a desperation maser um you know but normally just stay away from the sacred area you can ruin hammers really easily and that's why people are so uh, paranoid of voicing as long as you stay out of that steep you're good you understand Stay out of the steeple, you're good in all dimensions, and you're good. Holy steeple, the sacred area. A holy steeple, Batman. There you go. <laughs> um, and look, next... this, this gets fun because you're feeling stuff. You're using your incredibly brilliant body to give you feedback that very small percentage of piano technicians ever achieve skill in this level of work. And you should be one because that's who's going to make the money in the next 20 years. Piano technicians that have this skill. And the only way you can have it is to practice it. And the only way you can keep having it is to keep practicing it. So that behooves you to get clients that will allow you to do this work and trust you and that you can feel confident enough to say, look, this piano is not functioning at its full capacity. Give me a day with it. I'll make it sing. If you can say that and actually do it, you know, you're guaranteed you know, a really good living for the rest of your life. Unless you're greedy. Next question. Actually, uh, before, before that, I'll just mention, uh, for those people that don't know, a couple of interesting things. Um, for several weeks now, every week, for folks registered at the artisan level for Piano Technicians Masterclasses subscription, we have a piano tech mastermind where we meet with a small group of technicians. David is part of that. So, you know, if you like getting some 
some of his wisdom from a more personal level, um, feel free and join that. But also on top of that, if you join the convention upcoming at the, uh, at the highest level, then you're automatically included in those meetings until January 1st. So awesome. keep that in mind. And All right, next. Yeah, go ahead. Hold on. We're, we're having a great time at that. And this is exactly what, what human beings, artisan piano technicians need to raise their skills. I've looked at these classes and I've looked at the instructors and man, it's world-class stuff that we're having in December. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to teach a definitive class on how to tune a pure 12 tuning, you know, the sexiest thing in the piano world now, a pure 12 tuning. <laughs> and it's so much easier than all the heavy cerebral lifting about it. So much easier. It's, it's not simple. I mean, it's not, it's simple. It's not easy. It's very difficult to, to achieve a really good piano tuning, but it's simple. It's simple. And if you want to achieve the best equal temperament tuning you can possibly give to a piano, then you should check out this class. It's so simple. And also, uh, I'll say I'm just talking to um, Alex Kirstan, who I haven't met, but he's he's from Steingraber. We we interviewed That's Udo awesome. a few weeks ago, and he's joining us. I talked to him, to him about what he'll be teaching about, and he wants to talk about voicing and concert prep. And uh, he he even said as part of that, just just a part of it. Um, there's going to be a lot to that. You know, he's talking about the hammers all the way from the sheep to the concert hall and just really how they consider the hammers, especially for a piano maker like them that take a lot of individual control over the production of a piano. So I'm really looking forward to that and just looking forward to his enthusiasm. I mean, he was just elated to be a part of it and I'm glad that, that he's so excited and I think he's going to put together a really interesting class. I've spent um, hours. I've spent hours with this guy. He started off as a, just a rank apprentice in the Steingraber factory 30 years ago. Now he's the head of production for one of the greatest piano companies in the world. And he's, he finishes every single piano that comes out of Steingraber. And he's one of the greatest piano technicians in the world. I've spent hours and days with him. He's beyond, beyond space and time, man. He's got massive talent. So I'll see if we can squeeze in a few more questions here. Let's see. Um, regarding tone. Yes. I feel like there's another question I'm skipping though. Regarding needling on the player side, this one should be quick. For an upright, would it be the top side of the hammer? Yeah, it'd be the player yeah. side. The player yeah, side. Always the yeah. more always. easily accessible side. Yeah, and it, for those pianos, I, I just, I, I have a little jig. We have a little jig that lays the action down so we can get at the hammers. All right, now regarding tone from Johann Krebs, there are pianos with a sound that does not seem to match the voice of the singer as if the tonal spectrum of the piano does not match the resonant quality of the singer. Could that be a voicing issue or something else? Any thoughts on it that? It could be a voicing issue if you experiment with a voice of one note and see um, it's, you know, unless the singer is right there with you, you know, kind of working with you, you won't know until you get the whole piano voiced. But generally, just a quick reminder, just a quick reminder, David, careful of that microphone. I think you're. Oh. I'm uh, uh, oh, um, touching it oh, with your I'm, hand or something. I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I, I, I caress. <laughs> my computer is sitting on a pillow and my hand just absently, you know, caresses hey. the pillow. 
and that's what's <laughs> causing the number. Jeez, I'm sorry. No um, so anytime you work on the tone of a piano to have it sound better to your ears, it will sound better with voices. That's just like that. You can take that to the bank. Any improvement you make on the tone that your ears can hear on a piano is all good. And Johannes, I just want to tell you, man, trust your ears. If you can achieve a better piano tone by voicing and tuning and regulating and doing whatever, trust that. Your, your ears are hearing right. That's a better tone. And will blend better with whatever is happening, with a horn or a, or a violin or a voice or whatever. I think that's been my experience over 40 years of playing with players and singers. All right, next. We got we still got some time. You got five minutes left. Um, Good. Let's see here. We got... Is it possible to voice, this is from Emile Baudet, is it possible to voice so the sound becomes more powerful, but not necessarily more brilliant? Yes. And that's what, that's what this technique is about. Part of what this technique is about is allowing the, the, the note to be louder and seem louder because it's got, you're hearing more low partials. What I'm doing with this technique, this steeple technique, is again, emphasizing lower partials, tonic first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth partials and de-emphasizing the higher partials up into the teens, this, uh, the, the, the higher partials at, at a much higher level of frequency, masking those to a certain extent and allowing them to ring out only at the highest volume. That's, that's what expressive voicing is, consists of. All right. We have a question from Karel Wanganya. Have you ever used the tube technique on damper felt? The tube of air technique. Not, yes. I've stuck all kinds of needles into old nasty damper felt. Absolutely. You can use, and that's pretty good that that particular technique is, is a pretty good one because it does put a tube of air in and maybe take some of the rattle of an old damper felt out. Good job. Yes, absolutely. You can transfer that technique. I forget where Carell's joining us from, but it's quite far away. Put it in the chat if you, if you feel... If you get a chance, Carol. Um, let's see here. Let's see. We have Dave Skolnick, and then maybe that'll be the last one before we wrap up. Have you ever experimented with, with using thinner needles, number seven to 12, for the off air? For the off air? You mean for creating a tube of air underneath? Maybe. I'm not sure. Sounds about right. I think that's probably what he's referring to. See if you um, I have never done that. I have only used the number five, whatever the standard voicing needle. I think it's in English number five uh, uh, for that. But it's again the the needle in my chopstick voicing tool is fifteen millimeters long. And it's bent up to a 10, 12, 15 degree angle. So it can go straight under a string cut. 
when I prop the hammer up on the back check, I can get a straight angle under the string cut. All he right, then. Yes, that is what he was referring to. And by the way, um, Carol is from Indonesia. So it's a pleasure to have wow. you here. Thanks for joining us. Yes. Uh, Judy said such a perfect class. Thank you, David. We really appreciate this all, David. Um, so yeah, you want me to sign off for us? Please. Thank you, right. everybody. I had a great time. The time flew by. I was, I'm very happy in these circumstances. Thank you very much for your attention. Appreciate it. It's very good to have you here, David. Yeah, I'll just say, uh, remember we put some links in the chat. If you want to give some feedback, sign up for the convention. Don't want to miss it. Um, and Jude Reveille's class, which is coming up next Saturday. So look forward yeah. to seeing you later. Have All right. Day, Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. See you. Thank you so much for giving us an hour of your time. Remember that you can catch us live online every Saturday at 2 p.m. Eastern time. That's right. Go to pianotechradio.com to register so you can interact live and ask questions of our guests. See you next week.